Born in Cleveland, raised a hillbilly. What's your story? Welcome to the Hillbilly Justice on the School Bus podcast. Here's your host, Sarah Blossom Ware. Welcome to the sixth episode of the Hillbilly Justice on the School Bus podcast. I'm Sarah Blossom Ware, and I'm a professor at College of DuPage, and I also teach at Benedictine University. I wrote a memoir about growing up as an Arkansas hillbilly. The chapter I will now read is called The Hot Seat. Our highfalutin lifestyle was obviously attractive. Its grandiosity even managed to lure another family member away from downtown Cleveland to join in the fun. My mom's brother, Uncle Danny, drove down with whatever fit in his car when I was four years old. Then his car promptly died, but that was all right because it became his home at the curve in our driveway, just before the road took a steep turn downward. It was great fun having family close by. After a while, Uncle Danny decided to move out of his car and into the woods. He did not have a large army tent like us, though. It was more like a tarp draped over a fallen log. Even to a child, it seemed a little cramped. Uncle Danny lived on our property, out of his car, and in the woods for about a year. During the summer of 1978, while Uncle Danny still lived near us, my family hosted its first and only Big Hillbilly Party. I remember a keg and lots of people having fun. The main roads of our mountain were not well maintained, so you can imagine what our driveway was like. It was about a quarter mile long and was more like a winding ravine than a road. Our family car at this time was a 1965 Volkswagen Beetle, but today it was the party shuttle. Every half hour or so, my dad would take the Beetle down the ravine and pick up any guests who had gathered. I like going on these shuttle missions because I like the surprise of who might be waiting at the bottom. On the third shuttle trip, I was sitting in the back seat with our guests when it got very warm. I told my dad, it's really hot back here, to which he replied, it's an Arkansas summer. As we continued to drive, our guests also mentioned that it was really hot. As soon as we got to the cabin, we all jumped out. Dad touched the back seat, got a surprised look on his face and then quickly flipped the back bench seat over. Flames jumped high into the air. The engine had caught fire. No one seemed particularly alarmed. The burning beetle served as a great hillbilly bonfire for the party. <laughs> okay, so now it's time to reintroduce our panel members. Um, from you, we, we heard a little more about them in the last podcast, so if you're interested and are just tuning in now, you can go and hear um, Podcast 5 and find out more about them. But today we're just going to introduce ourselves by using um, six-word summaries. So go ahead, Len. Uh, my name is Len Cruz, and uh, my six words are family, Jesus, marriage, kids, music, and the barn. My name is Lane Severson, and my six-word summary is oldest of seven, father of five. My name is Benedict Wiesner. My six-word summary is, I'm part of a huge family. And my name is Crystal Norton, and my six-word summary is, my life, a never-ending roller coaster. Okay, thank you. So before we get into the discussion, I'd like to do a segment that I call, so what have you been busy with lately? So Crystal, so what have you been busy with lately? Um, well... I go to Benedictine University, like I said before, so Monday through Friday, I am in school at some room, some place there. I'm taking genetics, I'm taking um, organic chemistry lecture two, I'm taking biostatistics, so it's all these bio, I'm getting my degree in biology next year, so I'm taking a lot of core biology classes right now. And other than that, I actually just moved into a new apartment in Bolingbrook. So that's fun and new and random. And I also um, work four to five days a week at a restaurant serving tables. So I'm kind of constantly either studying or at work or keeping up with my puppy that's a pug and trying to sleep, sort of. <laughs> yeah, it's a busy college life. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, so now on to the panel discussion, which I'm really looking forward to. Um, the first question I'd like to throw out there is um, has to deal with family dynamics. 
And so when my Uncle Danny came to Arkansas and lived on our property, that was changing dynamics, um, adding someone new. Um, I just thought it was a lot of great fun because my uncle came. We had no family in Arkansas otherwise. But um, I wanted to ask you guys on the panel, was there a time that family dynamics changed for you and what was that like? Benedict? Uh, yeah, so one time, uh, this was a couple summers ago, uh, my cousins, we have nine uh, kids in my family and uh, there's like a million other cousin families that also have a million kids. So one of them uh, is, uh, my, uh, the family is my cousins, the Klaskis, and they have, uh, they had nine at the time and now they have 10. So a couple summers ago, um, we were in our house with our nine kids and the Klaskis had moved from Rockford to Charlotte um, a few years back and now they were in the process of moving from Charlotte to Topeka. So they were um, going coming back across the country, uh, but there was a gap. Uh, this was because of my Uncle Brent's work situation, but there was a gap between when one job ended and the new job in Topeka started. So um, there were about two and a half months where they needed to stay with family in Illinois. So uh, we opened up our doors to them and uh, our house with the nine kids became a house with 18 kids in oh. it. Um, <laughs> what kind of house do you have um, it's, it's a it's decent exploding, size. It sounds like. Um, yeah. It's a decent size, but you know, <clears throat> not very many houses are really built to accommodate 18 kids, no matter how big they are. And it's not a mansion by any, by any means. So, how many bedrooms, though? Um, I th let, me, let me think. Real bedrooms, I think we have four. Yeah. Yes. So kids. there were a Good lot, yeah. there were a lot of, um, <laughs> there were a lot of couch, there were a lot of uh, couches filled. Uh, and so the new dynamic was just that, um, you know, our house, had 18 kids in it and four adults. Um, and it wasn't all the time. Sometimes they would uh, uh, end up at my grandma's house uh, that was also nearby. But the experience was that um, our cousins who we get along with really well and, and we love them and we love spending time with them, you know, we got to live with them all together for a really long time. And it was great because we love spending time with them and, and you know, it's something we love to do, have them around. But when it was all over, I think um, the most uh, poignant, I suppose, observation that my mom made about it was that uh, it kind of taught us why those sort of communal living, utopian type of situations usually fail. <laughs> because you have these two families that really love each other and really get along great and think, you know, maybe we should just, <laughs> maybe we should just live together. Maybe we should form this communal living situation and, and, you know, that wasn't our intention, but that type of thing happens. Well, it doesn't really work out that way. Um, it's, it's just too hard to have 18, 18 kids and four adults living together in the same house. Um, it wasn't a disaster, but but by the time it was over, it was like, this is why that doesn't work. It was time <laughs> to be over. It was time yeah. for us to have, you know, to be living in two separate places. And then we were, and, but it, it was a great experience and we were really thankful for it. But it taught us, it, it was sort of like firsthand experience. Like, this is why that doesn't work. Don't try it. <laughs> <laughs> try it for a while. <laughs> Don't try it permanently. Yeah. All right. And who else would like to... Okay, I, I'm, Len? this is Len, and uh, we have a, a, a really big house, and it's not, like you said, it's not a mansion, but it's just really big. Uh, I think we have uh, between five and 6,000 feet of finished living space, so that's, that's pretty big. But even so, uh, oh, a number of years ago, a family got in a situation just like your, your cousins, mm -hmm. where they were about... Uh, some, somewhere between three and six months was the gap between when they had to move out of their current house and when their new house was going to be ready. And this was the Nacelli family, so a couple of you would know who that is. Mm -hmm. Anyway, they had, uh, they had uh, eight kids, and they moved in with us for about three to six months. I don't remember how long. And uh, <clears throat> that was uh, 
an amazing experience, and not in the way that you might think, uh, like uh, really hard, because the Nacellis, the parents, are like their thing in life is family. I mean, that's that's pretty much. If if they had their six word summary, it would have been kids, family, kids, family, kids, family. <laughs> you know. So, uh, and I mean that in in a very positive way. I mean, they just all about family. And one of the things that they really focus on is how to raise kids so that they're not out of control. And gosh, we never felt like the situation was out of control with all of those people in this living space, you know. It's they just did it so well and we became, you know, pretty much permanently good friends afterwards. So, mm-hmm. it was such a wonderful experience and their kids are really um They've really taught them how the the skills of being polite, don't overextend your welcome, you know, all kinds of like important life skills. They they taught them intentionally, and it was just really neat to see. Uh, they taught us a lot about stuff, that kind of stuff, just by their time. And uh, <clears throat> two others that come to mind: Claudia was uh, and I were working at the youth group at church. And there was a young lady that was sniffling and crying. And we said, well, what's wrong with you, uh, uh, Caitlin? And she said, oh, we've been living at the shelter and this for four weeks, and this is our last night. Tomorrow we have to move out onto the street. We're going to live in our car. And Claudia said, no, you're not. You're going to move in with us. So she came home and said, Len, we're going to have uh, a mother and a daughter move in with us. So they show up at the door and there's a mother and a daughter and a one-year-old boy. <laughs> <laughs> so they they took over our room and we moved into another room and they lived with us for about a year and a half that time. And it was it was hard at first because she was her her experiences were not uh, um, they weren't your experiences. Yeah, they weren't our experiences. And we had a little bit of a uh, of a merging together uh, time when we had to figure each other out. But over time, <clears throat> she, she uh, actually really got touched by the Lord. And it changed her life. It changed her way of thinking. And that really speeded up the uh, merging process. And uh, again... Um, uh, we 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 loved them to, to to tears, you know. Eventually, and and uh, when they moved out, uh, it was really uh, bittersweet, you know. Mm-hmm. It was good that it was over. It was a year and a half, but it was we were going to miss them. And their moving out process didn't work out so good, so they moved back in for no. another year <laughs> after that. So, uh, and how and, many families do you think have been in and out? Boy, I don't know. Claudia. <laughs> families are individuals. It's yeah, be, yeah, I mean, it's 20s, a lot. Huh? Yeah, it's in, I think it's in the 20s, yeah. somewhere yeah. like that. We've had lots of people right. for short and long stints. Our cousin, nie- nieces and nephews from various parts of the country would come and live with us all summer long. Half the, yeah. you know. It's kind of your my thing. Kid, yeah. 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 <laughs> so we've, we're a community. Helping people out. And yeah. the, latest, the latest is my son David has three children. And his wife just became a, an atheist and decided that oh. they should split up. So, um, uh, so David asked us if he could move in with us. So they have the basement now, which is uh, like three bedrooms and it's got its own kitchen and stuff. So, so that's the latest. And wow. uh, I have to say that uh, little kids are a little more energetic than I remember them. <laughs> <laughs> we get Claudia and I get a little tired quicker than we used to. But it's it's been really wonderful. Yeah. So, all right. We love the communal thing. Right. It, it wears us out too, though. I mean, you know, it's <laughs> sure. just like yeah. yeah. We had a situation where Lane. Okay. we were. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm Lane. A uh, situation where we were in between living places ourselves, our family, and we had two kids at the time, and we're pregnant with number three, and. Um, a, uh, a family that knew us said, well, we're going to, they were kind of snowbirds, right? So they, uh, they would live in the Chicago area during the summer when it's nice and, and do their gardening and different things. And then they would fly down to Mexico and live there during the winter. 
and said, well, we're not going to be using our house during the winter if you guys want to have it. So um, the way it was set up, we were going to have their house for, I think, four or five months and, and go live there. And they had, a, uh, they said, you know, the use the house like you would use your own house. You know, if you want to have uh, Thanksgiving here, go ahead. If you want to throw a New Year's Eve party, go ahead. You know, whatever. It's this is Chuck and Moni. Chuck and Moni. Yeah. Uh, Leonard knows them from church. Um, so, so we are, we were all set up in their home. They said, the only thing is um, we can't bring our dog with us. So you guys, you have to watch the dog. And they have, they had this dog, uh, Mercy, who was a miniature Doberman Pinscher. I think that's what it is. And, has all the attitude of a Doberman Pinscher, but is, you know, the size of a Starbucks cup. She was just super tiny <laughs> and would run around and just yap. And we said, that's, that's fine. That's more than fair. They weren't charging us rent or anything. And, um, it helped us out. And right around, let's see, before Christmas, they had a break. Well, they were going to go visit their son. And so they came back. So it's a little bit opposite, right? We're in their house. They came back to live with us and in their own home. Um, and that was interesting. Um, but then, uh, they left again and a couple weeks later, their dog started acting really strange. Mercy was making all these weird, she would just make these weird coughing noises and we would Skype them and be like, your dog's acting really weird. Should we take her to the vet or what's going on? And they're like, nah, she's probably fine. And so, um, one Sunday I was actually uh, guest speaking at our church. I'm getting ready to, to walk out and, and do the message at church. And I get a call from Laura, my wife, and she goes, uh, Mercy's dead. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> and I said, what? She goes, yeah, I, I went in the laundry room and she was just laying there, you know, stiff oh. as a board. I don't know when she died, but she just kicked it. And I'm like... <laughs> I literally, I can't do anything about this. I got to go. Like I'm talking for the church, you know, I got to go do this. <laughs> and she goes, well, I don't know what to do. You know? So she ended up calling up her dad and, uh, and they figured the whole thing out. But it, it I, yeah, we, we don't ask us to house sit. We kill, we kill the dog. <laughs> oh no. Oh, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Timing is too bad. Everything. Yeah, <laughs> for the house. Guys. Yeah, thanks, Lay. Lay. <laughs> the one job we had. Yeah, we, we totally it. failed at keeping your dog alive. <laughs> <laughs> oh my. All right. So, any anything else? Um, yeah. So? I um, because I moved around a lot. Like I wasn't really ever in the same place. I was actually born in Illinois. So as people think when I say like I lived in Tennessee and stuff, they're like, oh, it's your, you're like a southern girl, like you know, like that. And I'm like, no, I was actually born in Mount Prospect out here. <laughs> And I lived in Michigan for some time in an apartment because it was my, I have a half sister that's older than me and it was me, her, and my mom. And my dad would always come to, you know, come visit. So it's not like he was gone. He would come visit me and stuff. But I lived in Tennessee for five years. I lived in Alabama. I lived in uh, Maryland. And that's, um, I just lived in a whole bunch of different places. And I, when I um, was in fifth grade, I went to six different schools, like I said earlier. And that's because I lived in like Columbia, Tennessee. I lived in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. I lived in Highland Park, Tennessee. And like in one year, and like sometimes like one time I walked out of school, my mom's like, we're moving. I'm like, okay, <laughs> bye. <laughs> you know, yeah. so, all right. And it was kind of like, so kind of normal, which isn't awesome. This is, that's not good. But, you know, it was kind of like, bye friends that I met this year. <laughs> and um, my, actually my grandma on my, my dad's side, his adoptive parent, you know, but she was always my grandma. She was awesome. Um, she was okay with my mom and everything. And my sister, my older sister and my mom had a falling out uh, when she was like 12. They got into a thing and my, my grandma offered, hey, you know, if you want Amber, my sister, to to come stay with me at my house, like that's okay, you know. Well, and I, like, then she decided to come down, and I was like, me and my sister didn't really get along, so I was like, whatever, cool, <laughs> we a little break. But then my grandma was like, do you want to come with? And I was like, I love my grandma, of course I want to come with. And my mom was like, okay, you guys go to Maryland, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna finish some stuff up here, down here, and uh, I'll come up with you. And then I live with my grandma. My grandma noticed how we were not treated very good as children by my mother and she was like do you want to 
you know, talk to your dad because my mom had full custody of me. Mm. And I was like, I want, yeah, I'd love to see my dad more. I love him. He's awesome. So that's when I had the transition of moving from Maryland to Illinois to live with my father and my stepmother, who it was like the best thing that ever happened to me. So I lived in Maryland for a year and she took care of me. And I got to say, if it wasn't for that woman, mm. I would not probably be in this area of the country. So I was kind of like all over the place for a long time and now and then I moved to Arizona for a year and then that didn't work out as well as I wanted it to so I'm kind of like always all over and I'm, I'm not used, yeah I'm never in the same place where I can have like I'd like to get to a place you know you know when I'm done with school and I can get a house and be like this is my house I'm not renting it and I'm not moving and it's mine and I could have like you guys have people yeah. you know, come and stay with you so I wonder if that will be hard for you I mean I just wonder Stupid. if it yeah. will be hard to do that because you're so used I'm to used to being on the move moving. and I'm not, not necessarily the bad thing like I'm not like sad about it you know like it's kind of good it freshens things up but I think yeah when I'm in one place I'll be like this is weird <laughs> <laughs> yeah I don't, I don't think you're alone I, I think a lot of people have had that experience yeah. oh yeah definitely um, and especially like people say in the military where mm -hmm. they go from place to place but even just regular people, you know, sometimes you got to move to find a job. Yeah, especially when you're young and you, just, yeah. you need money and you need to go to school or whatever. Yeah, right. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. I, I'm glad you guys are you're sharing very intimate yes. details. But I mean, <laughs> thank you for feeling like you're, yeah. you're free to do that. Um, all right, so let's go on to the next question, um, which is about... The hillbilly party, sort of. So I just remember one party, that was it. You know, my parents aren't, they don't really hype up for Christmas or anything really. Um, birthday parties were always, we have one picture. You could just take one picture and that's our birthday parties growing up in the in the trailer house that we eventually moved into. And it's, it's just us, the kids sitting around the table there and that's the picture <laughs> with a, like a cake. So, um, there wasn't a lot of partying going on, um, just the one that I um, talked about in that chapter. So, but I'm just wondering, you know, what was it like for you guys? At, were, were there memorable parties in, at your houses, or, or no? You know, <laughs> what made them memorable? I have, I have one. If you, yeah, Len. Yeah, um, we got married in June of 1974, and. Uh, we moved out to Elgin shortly thereafter, and we started having these picnics on our anniversary. And these things developed a life of their own. And by the time we got to like the eighth or ninth one, we had hundreds of people coming to these picnics. One of the one of our friends joked and he said, "You you got to get the Channel Seven minicam out here. This is awesome." There was. Uh, three-legged races and uh, tug of war and balloon toss and egg toss and this and that and the, I mean just all kinds of stuff going on and there were kids everywhere because we were uh, we had you know by that time we had, had we had three four five kids well, however many and all of our friends were in the same boat so there were kids everywhere and grandmas and grand it was just a great thing we we would take over about half of Lord's Park at one time and uh, finally uh, uh, Claudia finally said on our 10th anniversary, she said, you know what? These picnics are fun, but I'm worn out. So <laughs> number 10 was the last one. And uh, I remember the pie eating contest. Uh, my friend Ludwig that I've mentioned to some of you before, he, he and his girlfriend got into a pie throwing contest about halfway <laughs> through the pie eating contest. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they tried to wash it all off, but everybody was uh, sticky and smelly the rest of the day. It was uh, watermelon, too. Oh it was watermelon eating, hot dog eating contest. It was, uh, it was something else. So anyway, that was the last of those parties. And I, and, uh, I missed them, but Claudia was happy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's a, a lot. That's a big memorable thing. Ten years worth. Yeah, ten wow. years worth. So it was fun. <laughs> It started out actually as you know those kind of parties where you invite the uh, the wedding party on yeah. your anniversary. Yeah. I think that's not that uncommon, but it just grew from there. <laughs> wow! All right. well, you went out with a bang. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <throwing> <laughs>
That's fantastic. I think the, the, the summary of our family's attempts at partying would be uh, like missteps, you know, <laughs> partying missteps where we attempted to, to have fun or to do something and it, it didn't work out. And I think um, what would epitomize it was, you know, what my mom, I think similar to, uh, to your mother, you were talking about, you know, it's kind of the, the fake hippie thing. Oh, yeah, you know? yeah. My mom growing up was like ahead of the curve on the whole organics movement yeah. and you know, was part of a local food co-op ordering in organic foods because they didn't Trader have Joe's it at like, what, how much Trader Joe's? They didn't have Trader Joe's oh, where we were. Oh, so she was like <laughs> doing her own thing. But a lot of the similar stuff, yeah. you know, we, we had those panda licorice. That was like the only candy we had growing up. Oh, was, yeah. was, this panda brand licorice, it's like all organic. And anyway, um, so she was very into healthy eating and would even order in like uh, five gallon drums of her own wheat to grind and like make wow. bread and do all that <laughs> stuff. Yeah. Um, so there's, there's really good parts of that. And then there's parts where it's like, you know what? Um, I always tell these people when they're dieting and stuff too, you know, if you're going to diet, don't eat the diet desserts. Like there's just <laughs> either do them or don't do them at all. <laughs> my mom did that with the health food. So for my brother, Evan's second birthday, she made him a poppy seed lemon cake that was supposed to be like organic poppy seeds and stuff in it. And you know, normally a baby, when they get a cake put in front of them, <laughs> they dive right <laughs> in. They dive right in, right? <laughs> they stick their face in it. They're just like, how do I get more of this goodness into me? Be the cake. <laughs> yeah. And Evan kind of looked at the cake <laughs> and considered it. You know, it's just not something a baby should Sadness. be doing with a cake. You know, yeah. And then, you know, kind of tentatively grabbed a little bit of it and ate it. And was not having it and just you know, like pushed the rest of it off and just sat there and, and it's just you know and my mom gave all the rest of us a little piece of this lemon poppy seed cake and we're all like this is not this is not good <laughs> <laughs> so much for organic huh yeah so if you're gonna have a party you know do a party right you know have a real cake and you know Sound well, like think, it sounds like you guys didn't have much of a problem with that. No, uh, Claudia is always, one of her quests is always to get me to eat healthy, and it's never succeeded. I, I still uh, still go to Portillo's. <laughs> and if I'm going to drink a Coke, I'm going to drink a real Coke, because I, I don't know what that stuff that they make it taste sweet is, but it's, it's weird. It's I'm got something you. in it. It's got some kind of hydrochloric acid or something. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, our parties are um, something that happen often in the summer. Um, we kind of just, we used to do it more almost every Sunday. There would be um, this pack of huge vans in our driveway oh, wow. because right. everyone brought, like, like I said, 10 kids. When you, <laughs> here's the thing about being a family of nine or 10 kids everyone else you know also has nine or ten kids they're it the just, only people that can get along it, together, yeah it basically. just somehow happens <laughs> that um whether it's from like a homeschool group those are pretty common and mm. everyone has ten kids or like a church and everyone has ten kids or you just kind of meet other people that have ten kids and become friends with them i don't know <laughs> so uh um Often during the summers, uh, we have these situations where um, there are just a ton of people at our house and a ton of kids running around in the yard. And they just kind of, like I said, it's in a forest preserve, basically. So they kind of just run around in the forest and, and you know, hopefully they're back by the time the party's over. <laughs> um, but you want to have at least 90% return. Yeah, that's, you've got a good return on investment good, yeah. on the party if you, if you get 90% of the kids back. So um, the biggest thing about them, though, is that everyone brings instruments, um, banjos and drums and, and guitars, oh, basses, ukuleles, and it's just this like kaleidoscope of instruments, and uh, everyone is just basically jamming. And our whole neighborhood sounds like um, like a country folk punk concert <laughs> um and it just it lasts you know until like one or two in the morning and then and that's it so that's that's the summer that's the summer party experience at the wiesner house and, and they're really they're really fun and something i've really 
appreciate it. So this summer we're all Yeah, going. you're all invited to <laughs> Wildwood Drive. I'll have to but find a few have to more bring kids. at least eight kids with yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. I got neighbors. Okay. <laughs> I'll be part of the group. <laughs> okay. Yeah, or we could sync up, too. Yeah. I think yeah. our kids plus your kids, we well, have enough. Our house is just kind of that way where it's just like our doors are always open to everyone. And it's not at all uncommon for my mom to walk in from the grocery store and find like five new friends <laughs> that she doesn't know. And children like, oh, that didn't hello. Get and it's just <laughs> sort of like this stomping ground or this, this watering hole for everyone to just come to our house and just hang out. And so you've got all these big families that we're family friends with, but also, you know, um, like high school friends of me and, and, and my sisters, just a bunch of them will suddenly come over and we'll say, oh, we're having a party, by the way. So you know, come on over. And so you just have this huge conglomerate of families and, and like teenagers and college age kids just hanging out and playing music and stuff like that. What so, do you play? Um, me yeah. personally, I just bought a banjo. Um, I'm kind of behind the curve. Everyone else is, you know, way into my brother. Nick is Okay, I remember my siblings' birthdays because they don't change, but their ages do change. So I don't know how old he is. He's like 10 or 12 or something. It's <laughs> so, a lot to keep up with. Yeah, yeah. he um, he plays uh, banjo, ukulele, and then one day he just picked up a bass and started playing it really well. Like, he just can play any of these instruments. He's, he's yeah. going to listen to this and be like, I'm 16 yeah. or something. Yeah. Like, God. I really don't. Do you even know me? <laughs> he's not, like, tall enough to be that old, so I'm pretty sure he's, like, tall. <laughs> but I am the one, I, and, and everyone else plays, in, you know, my sisters all play piano. Most of them play guitar and ukulele as well. Everyone plays an instrument, and then I'm the oldest one, and I'm like, uh, you know. <laughs> So I finally bought a banjo and I'm learning it. And so this summer is going to be the summer that I start, you know, really You're jamming. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, but um, it sounds so familiar. All the instruments and stuff. Our yeah. Family does the same thing. It's it's great. Well, you have second Saturday. Yeah, yeah. We have the uh, music thing. It used to be once a month for uh, probably about 16, 18 years. We've been doing it where we uh, turn our living room, which is a 45 by 35 foot uh, great room. And we turn that into a uh, coffee house and set up a sound system and everything. Our most famous uh, performer was Rich Mullins. He lived with us for about the, uh, those of you that might know a little bit about Christian music, he was pretty well known. Yeah. And uh, anyway, he lived with us the last three year, three weeks rather of his life. The day he left our house was the day he got in, in the uh, uh, accident with the truck that, that killed him. And, uh, but anyway, we would uh, open it up for, and you know, people would come from all over the place, uh, Wisconsin, Indiana, all kinds of places. And, there, this, and, and the skill range was pretty wide, too. Wide, you yeah. Some people like... Ha Talent is optional was our slogan. <laughs> uh, and it was true, because one, one of the memories of Laura and I's dating years is that we tried to do a duet thing at one of these second Saturdays. <laughs> And we both remember it, and I'm sure it was, as completely horrific. And even today, if either one of us mentions it, we both get, like, completely embarrassed. You have that feeling of like, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> why did we do that? <laughs> Playing instruments, duet? Oh, yeah, or? yeah, oh. yeah. So uh, I had written a song, I guess you would call it, and <laughs> I, I was trying to play the guitar. And Laura's actually a talented uh, piano player, but only... Like, she has to have all the notes in front of her, and so she's not used to... She has to have the dots. She has to, yeah. She has to be reading the music, and she can't... She's not a... She would tell herself she can't jam. Mm. And I can't <laughs> play along with music, and it was it was just a disaster. <laughs> it was... It, it's funny to think back on, but, you know... Well, Bill Schenk outdid you. He, he tried to do a jam <laughs> session singing with... Uh, with uh, and, and he asked, uh, can anybody play guitar along with us? And this gentleman who uh, was there... Uh, who had no idea how to jam, tried to jam with, <laughs> and, and Bill is not that good of a singer anyway, he would admit that. Uh, and uh, uh, anyway, uh, I'm sure he had something really good in his mind because he's a great uh, arranger. He and my son Pete come up with some great stuff, uh, but uh, he, uh, the, uh, the mix didn't work very well. <laughs> and you had people streaming for the exits about halfway through the song, I think. Oh, man. <laughs> All right, well, Crystal, what do you have on Okay, well, first thing you should know is that the Norden family, my parents and my little brother, and it, we're very modern when it comes to parties. And my parents also think that they're 
22, mm. and I'm 21, so it's a weird. And they thought they were 22, like when I was like 16, so <laughs> I couldn't even partake in their kind of fun. But my parents, like all the time, like even like little parties, kind of parties, have my neighbors over, and they're all friends. They all have kids around the same age. It's like it's just smaller, like a couple kids. And they all hang out, like all buddies, and they you know drink and eat food and do all this stuff. But for instance, um, I had a birthday party for my 16th birthday, and then my 18th also, and I think I had a going away type thing when I went to Arizona, but my 18th stands out because, one, we had a DJ, which was even cooler than the small band I had at my 16th, which was just a local band that played, but we had a DJ, that was my neighbor, and we had, um, not a bounce house, but you know, like, the adult bounce house where you could actually, like, hurt yourself, like, the ones that you can, like, joust on, uh, Oh yeah. and, like, there's, like, a bungee run, Right, <laughs> and it's just like you should have to take out like an insurance policy for mm. this kind of stuff you because probably do. I, I don't even know, but my dad's <laughs> friend owns waivers. <laughs> if you're going to use this, you're on your own, babe. My dad's friend owns a bounce house place, oh. so we got to like keep it like all night, which was dumb because you have a bunch of people who are <laughs> playing bags in the sun all day, drinking like a bunch of adults who think that they're 22 and invincible. Yeah, and they're on it. And it's next to this fence, um, and I was taking after my father I talked about and doing a, a cartwheel oh and doing a round off on this because it's bouncy and fun. And I like, there's like the edge of it, and I just like, you know, I was going to fall into it because it's bouncy. Okay, well, when it's in, against a fence, <laughs> it's not, it kind of goes in farther, and I whacked my head so hard on this fence. And I just remember sitting down, and like my friend who was in my neighborhood was like, are you okay? And that's all I remember. And I was like, yeah, I'm great. And then I woke up the next day <laughs> in my bed. And my friend was like, left me a note, like next to my pillow, my, my good friend back then. She was like, hey, I put you to bed. Like, <laughs> like I'm like, what's wrong with me? And two days later, I found out, she's like, yeah, you hit your head pretty hard. And I'm like, when did I hit my head? She's like, you hit your head on that fence at your, your birthday. I'm like, and you put me to sleep. I had a concussion. She's like, yeah, you threw up, too. I'm like, yeah. She's like, I thought you were just sick. I'm like, no. I... So you were at this big alcohol party throwing up and couldn't remember what's going on. Yeah, and she's like, like, I thought you were just. Obviously, I just drank too much. No. Actually, really serious. Yeah, I was like, you shouldn't have put me to sleep. I, I probably should have stayed up a little. She's like, oh, my bad. Like, you know, and, like, I mean, there was a lot of, like, uh, casualties. And, I like, my stepmom chipped her tooth. My neighbor, like, oh. broke his wrist. So I'm like, you guys are, my parents, yeah, they're, they are fun people at the, the Nordens. They are, and it's like, and they'll do any, it'll be like any excuse to have a party. It's like, oh, it's National Cat Day. Woo, let's, yeah. you know, let's do something awesome, you know. Talk like a pirate day. Yeah, they'll be like, oh, that sounds great. Is it on a Friday? Okay, <laughs> great. That's fantastic. I don't have work for another 48 hours. <laughs> so I, I love them. They're so much fun. And now that I'm older and I can, like, partake in, you know, in adult conversations and, like, drink and all that kind of stuff with them. And, um, like, it's it's a lot of fun. Like, I love all of them. It's like they're on the same. But they they think that they're my age. And I sometimes have to think that I'm their parent. Yeah. Sometimes I'm like, come on, let's go to bed. <laughs> like, yeah. done to, let me lock up the that's house. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, all hey, right, calm down. So that's, I'm, that's taking, kinda... I'm taking the uh, tap out of the keg. Done. <laughs> yeah. We Keep used to have a kegerator in my parents' garage. There you go. And I was like, that's pretty cool. I mean, that's not there anymore, <laughs> but that's kind of cool. My parents, they're fun people. If you ever want to have some fun, so go, we're going go to talk Benedict's. to Benedict's. For, yeah. the for the jam session. And, and we're going to Here's Crystal's the after for the party. After, after party, yeah. late night, DJ, you know. It was like, we, once a year we get the cops called from just because loud music and there you go. my dad's like, it's fine. You want to come hang out? I don't think like, that's happened to us yet. No. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if you heard of Manuka. Illinois. Manuka, oh, yeah. sure. Yeah, party I central. It's it. about this big. Yeah. <laughs> How do you say it? Manuka. Manuka. People Manuka. say Manuka and it makes my ears hurt. Yeah, see, so I just everyone, hurt you there. Manuka. Okay. I Shanahan. just always know it exists and that it's like it's this big. A, way the heck's down it's south, a truck stop. right? Yeah, it's uh, oh wow, okay. Yeah, it's it would take I don't know from here from from the university. It used You're to not take that me. far from Joliet. Oh right? no, I work in Joliet because so, that yeah. would give everybody a reference. Here. Yes, Joliet. Joliet um, takes me it would take me ten minutes to my house from Joliet. Okay. So, but it's like giant truck stop. 
like it's like gas station, Taco Bell, McDonald's, and gas stations. And it's like welcome to Minooka, where we have corn and gas stations <laughs> <laughs> and parties and parties. And, Great you know, parties. And, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Isn't it right off of like I fifty five or I fifty seven or eighty? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yes. Okay. All right. So let's go on to the next. Let's discuss some more things. Um, this is a question from my mom. So she says, "Okay, country folks know how to make the best of things, like with the burning beetle. We just, you know, nobody really got upset, and it was like really cool to watch it burn. Never so." Um, describe a time when your parents or grandparents made the best of a tough situation. Well, um, I have, yeah. So the legendary tough situation of my childhood was one in the early, early 2000s. I think it started in 2000 and lasted, uh, through like 2002, maybe early 2002. My dad quit his job and got sued for quitting his job and it was a real mess. Um, he worked for a hedge fund, I think, and there was a lot of, you know, greed involved, and it it was a messy situation and not, you know, a happy thing. Um, and after it, I ha- after it all culminated, he ended up winning. Um, so, you know, it was, you know, not a lawsuit that we lost, but it was re- a really, you know, hard, hard, horrible thing to be getting sued. And um, so he, he did not have a job. He was getting sued. He had all these legal fees. An unbelievable amount of stress on my parents, and uh, then my mom got pregnant with kid number uh, five. Was that seven seven five seven or? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's Nick. That's the one I was talking about, the musician. So um, when that first happened, my mom was like, "God is just laughing at us at this point, or whatever. <laughs> like this is, our, like, are you kidding me? We got pregnant right now, and." Um, you know, we have no money. We have no, we have no idea what the future is going to hold. We might be, you know, homeless. Who knows what's going to happen? It didn't end up happening that way, but that was like the most crisis pregnancy time ever. So um, I guess the way they made the best out of that situation is just by, um, you know, by the time Nick was born, he was like the best baby ever. And uh, the previous baby, Cecilia, had been the worst baby ever. She was, like, (laughs) so horrible, did not stop crying, would not eat, just, like, and the worst pregnancy, too. Um, My mom said she was really sick. So Nick ended up being, like, this perfect baby, unbelievably happy all the time, like, the fattest, cutest baby. (laughs) He was, like, just a ball of fat. And, And now he's grown into this, like, really happy kid who plays music all the time. So... I guess um, looking back on it, they they just have this attitude like, I, we could not believe how, um, you know how bad this timing was for suddenly we're pregnant with Nick mm-hmm. and we have already four kids to feed and no job and things are just horrible right now, but like there's no like you can't even um, you can't even uh, describe how worth it it is to like have Nick around that type of thing. And uh, so, yeah, the way they made the best out of the situation was just by realizing, you know, no matter how hard it was, Nick is all, Nick, just like the other nine, other eight, is a huge blessing, and we love having him, and so it, it was, it seemed like the worst timing in the world, but, you know, at this point, it's a good thing that Nick's around. <laughs> Aw, that's a nice story. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's good. <laughs> Anyone else? Uh... Uh, don't get me started. Okay, <laughs> well, we'll let Crystal go. <laughs> uh, I guess I could talk about my grandma. So this, my grandma Carol is my, my dad's adoptive mother. She passed away um, when I was 17. And she was very, like, she super, like, like took care of me after, you know, like, all my life. She taught me, she lived in Tennessee, too, and then she lived in Maryland. She lived in a bunch of places. But she was, like, the kind of woman that taught me how to swim, and, like, I was, like, I don't know, she didn't have a daughter, so it was like, I was her baby. Like, and I had my older sister, but, like, we had different fathers, so, and she loved her, too, but I was just, like, I was a little one. Like, I was always around, I was always like, Grandma, you know. And my grandma, like, she went through so much. Like, I, my grandma actually had one eye, 
Mm. And she was awesome because of it. Like, she was so <laughs> cool. And I used to, like, be, like, she had, like, a glass eye. She, told, she lost it when she was younger, like, with a complication of a surgery, like, you know, a long time ago when she was you know, probably a teenager or something. She said she used to have a glass eye, and she'd put it in, like, make it fall out, and be like, oh, my God, Mom, to her mom. And she'd be like, Carol, don't do that. <laughs> so she was comfortable. It's not like it was, like, a bad thing. She was comfortable with it, you know. And I used to, like, make faces at her and be like, yeah, you can't see me, which is not nice. <laughs> but she's my grandma. And um, she, like, had a lot of health issues. She had um, breast cancer twice, and she got both actually removed, like, at different times. And she then got leukemia and died of pneumonia when I was 17. So she was like a trooper. Like she was like this fat lady and like, you know, and she, but she's always so happy and she, you know, took care of me and my sister when we were younger. So is she the Polish one? That no, this is, no, well, this, no, is no uh, grandma, right? this is Maryland grandma. I know I got a lot of grandmas. And that was, <laughs> got a, lot of, a lot of people going on. No, this is just, this is my grandma Carol. She's, um, I call her my Johnny Cash grandma because mm -hmm. she really, really, really liked Johnny Cash. I actually have a tattoo on my, on my foot of Johnny Cash lyrics for her when she passed or after a couple years. So, but she like took care of us and she got kind of just screwed over by a lot of people in her life. And I mean, but she was always like pushing forward and like looking at the best in people. Like people like, oh, can I, can I stay with you at your place? Or can I like, do you have any money I could borrow? I'll pay you back. And she didn't have a lot at all. And, but she always like gave everything. And like, mm -hmm. that's kind of the attitude yeah, like, that's great. I don't know if I'm going off track at all, but like the attitude I have is, you know, like you should look for the best in people. I mean, I mean not always because she kind of sometimes had the worst luck, but um, she went through a lot of, of tragedies and she like never, I never saw her put like her head down, even though she had so much going on with her. She was like, as long as I got my little family, like I'm good. That's Aww. awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. That's sweet. She was super cool. So speaking of track, what was the original question? <laughs> I know, I know, I know. I kind of went off no, on the, the original question is um, describe a time when someone made the best of a tough oh. situation yeah. oh, yeah. In, right. when you're growing up. So that was definitely on track. Yeah. Yeah. That was awesome, actually. Yeah, good one. So, any other takers on that one? I, I, I'll I'll uh, <laughs> I'll defer to the rest of you. <laughs> I've said enough. Yeah. No. All right, so let's go to what's become my favorite question. Um, we had, um, it, with the last panel, I had this question, and I liked the answer so much that I think probably with every panel we'll have this question. So this is when, way back, a few podcasts back, there was a story about when my dad took my brothers for a walk, and they came back with no shoes on, and my mom never could figure out why. No one would ever tell her. My father wouldn't tell her, and my brothers wouldn't tell her. They just said they didn't know. And um, only a few years back, she found out the real story. So mm -hmm. this is the question of the hour <laughs> to the, the panel here is, was there something in your childhood that you did not know the whole story of until much later on? Well, mm -hmm. I'll jump right in. So All right. I, Lane? I, yeah, this is Lane. I had mentioned before... Um, my grandpa being kind of a road uh, road rage person and my mom inheriting that. Um, and there's these fantastic stories that my grandpa's road rage actually is legendary because there's these fantastic stories of him and his uh, brothers driving up to Wisconsin. They were building a cabin up there. And there's a story where they were driving back and they had gotten cut off by a guy. And my grandpa just went nuts and ro drove up next to them and forced them off the road and then walks back, pulled the guy out of his car and just slugs him in the face. Oh, and God. then gets back in his car and drives off. And there's all these sorts of stories that, you know, like, man, Grandpa oh, was like, some real road rage. yeah, you don't mess with him on the road. <laughs> well, uh, years, uh, I was, I mean, I was an adult. My grandparents um, had moved into a condo and I, I had gone over there for, um, I was working on a project. I wanted to try and capture more of their life and kind of piece it together because you get all like you said you get all these stories throughout your life and like how did how did this fit together and didn't you do this and didn't you do that and, yeah. and how, you know and so we're talking and as the conversation's going on i'm realizing that basically my grandpa had no concept of don't drink and drive that he was oh. constantly like 
drinking and driving all the time. He's telling me all these stories. He was in the painters union in the city that we were in. And he's telling me all these stories like, yeah, I'd be driving along and then, uh, you know, Philip would come get me and, you know, who's Philip? Well, Philip was, you know, the, the police officer. And he'd be like, Maury, you're drunk, go home, you know. <laughs> and so a lot of it started to kind of pull together and make sense. Like, oh, wow, okay, so you basically were drinking and driving, like, maybe not all the time, but a lot of the time. That actually fills in a lot of the gaps yeah, here think, behind yeah, these road yeah. rage yeah. stories. So, <laughs> yeah, you know, I was like, ah, that's not something a sober person does. That makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't. I think your mom probably hasn't slugged someone, like forced him off the road. And she didn't. I wouldn't yeah. give. I, she might have forced him. I don't know. It hasn't slugged anybody. No. <laughs> no, but it's so true. I mean, when when I was remembering things, there were things you just take your, for granted. You know, you hear things, and you know, then you, later when somebody asks a certain question, like um, with my bath, you know, I, I somebody asked me once. So, um, what did you do in the winter for a bath? And I was blank. I had no <laughs> answer. And, you know, and I had to call my mom and I said, what did we do in the winter time to bathe? And she's like, oh, I just sponged you off, you know. And, but there are lots of gaps, you know, until you really start digging in and trying to f remember and figure out and go, hey, wait a minute, this doesn't connect here, you know. It's, it's really interesting what kids just accept and don't question, you yeah. know. It's, yeah. It's very interesting. That's awesome. Crystal, you have some I, I do have story? mine's mine's kind of not like the happiest type of story, but you know. Mm -hmm. So like I said, my mom, my real mother had some issues. She obviously had s some issues, you know, with herself and like, you know, she's I'm hoping working on that now. But we lived with her me and my sister lived with her when we were small and I remember a time going um to the dentist with my sister and my mom and my mom was in there for a while. And I don't, I don't remember what we were doing. I just, like, played with the like, little kid things that they have going on. And I remember another time, like, my mom was now, like, able, she had dentures. My mom now had dentures. Like, she could, like, take them out. And, like, it was weird. And I didn't really understand. I'm like, why You're do you have... brushed my teeth for Yeah, and she was only in her 30s, like, early 30s. And I didn't question it. I was like, oh, mom, you have fake teeth, and it freaks me out. Don't let me see that. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's weird. <laughs> and I, like... I just, and I, we asked her, like, why did you, like, they're like, oh, she's like, they had to remove some of my teeth, and I'm like, why? She's like, oh, I just, like, brushed them too hard, and, like, this and that, and, like, um, like she said something, and I was like, oh, okay, like, that makes sense, you know, I'm seven, I don't know, sure. yeah. <laughs> and I told my, my father, you know, just a couple of years ago, and it's like, yeah, mom, remember she has, like, dentures, because they weren't together anymore at this yeah. point at all for a long time, and I'm like, she uh, had, you know, dentures from brushing your teeth too hard and stuff, and he's like, what? He's like, that makes no sense. Yeah. He's like, Crystal, your mom was so bulimic for so long that the enamel on her teeth just disintegrated, like, and she had to have them pulled. And obviously, it's not probably the kind of story you want to tell your little children. Right. So she told us that, but I didn't even know until I was, you know, 18. I didn't that, know that was a consequence of yeah, the, it, the, it, acid, of the acid, stomach acid. Stomach acid. Stomach acid. Yes. So yeah, so I, I just, I thought for a long time, I was like, wow, my mom, she's getting punished for having such great hygiene. <laughs> like, <laughs> 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 poor thing, you know. It is weird that your mom's solution to, like, I don't want to tell this horrible story about my bulimia, so I will teach <laughs> Crystal the lesson. <laughs> Do not not brush your teeth too hard, yeah, or yeah. your teeth will fall out. <laughs> yeah, I was like, Ooh, I don't want that to happen You're, to me. Yeah, good thing you so, didn't take it to heart. That, that's sad, and I, I don't. I think probably. I think after that, she didn't really struggle with that anymore. Usually, you know, if you have that kind of thing happen to you, but it was like well, having all the teeth pulled out of my head. Yeah, yeah. I'd probably teach you like, well, that's probably not the route to. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. no. Put up so, with the extra little body fat, huh? Yeah, it's a little, it's, I mean, it's a sickness in itself, but. Um, you know, that's, that's just something I learned, like, when I was way older, and I'm like, oh, I feel like that's sadder than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's kind of the same thing, you know, you just, that's what she said, so. Mom says, mom's yeah, right, you just mom's right. Your parents. Right. I mean, yeah. you do. They know what, all. What else are you going to believe, yeah. right? right. I right. think whatever stories I don't know the full story of yet, I still don't know. <laughs> you, can't, you don't know. I can't think of something like that. There's probably there's so gotta, many. There's probably so many. I'm yeah. just anxious to. You know, I'm sure in 10 years I'll know all sorts of things. <laughs> well, my, my grandfather, uh, my, uh, my grandparents, uh, my, uh, I don't know if it was a po poker game or what, but 
he uh, he swapped his farm in Mitchell, South Dakota, which had a lovely, uh, you know, Victorian house on it, but it was a small farm, hundred and some acres, and he was they were on their tenth kid, and he said this farm is too small for us, so he swapped sight unseen for a a, a ranch, a thousand acre ranch. Ooh, sounds big, right? In western South Dakota. And it's actually currently now part of the Badlands National Monument. Oh, no. <laughs> it was not a good farm. And it was a sod house. So that may have started things. But when my dad was six, uh, his mother kicked his father out of the house. And I never really heard why that ever happened. My dad never wanted to talk about that. And maybe he didn't know because he was kind of little. But... Uh, I found out later at one uh, one of our, my uh, cousins, uh, you know how every family has somebody that's like the person that organizes all the reunions and yep. does all that kind of stuff. Well, <laughs> yep. that's her. And she did interviews of each of the, I think there were 10, 10 or 11 remaining aunts and uncles and my dad. Uh, and some of the truth of that came out. Uh, I knew that uh, my aunt Hannah, I never saw her. She died in her 30s, and I never, I never she was gone before I was born. And uh, it turns out that one of the stories was that she got kicked out of the house because uh, she tried to stop her father from really uh, punishing one of the little kids for something that she considered very minor. And when she did that, he kicked her out of the house permanently. He said, you have to go now. She grabbed a suitcase, put her stuff in. It's the last time she ever came home. He was, uh, he was a tyrant, I guess. And that was one thing. And the other thing was uh, there were always stories about Grandma being mad at Grandpa for taking care of his dear friends when our house is falling apart. The sod has leaks in it, and the, it was a sod house. Well, you know those things you see in the, in the history books of the pioneers in their sod houses that's the kind of house they had and uh, so that might have been the other part but I guess she did kick him out when my dad was six and uh, and he died five years later and so I never knew my grandpa but that was one of those kind of secrets wow yeah it's what's so important about writing things down or getting the oral mm -hmm. Histories, the history stuff, yeah. right? Right. Because when they're gone, they're then gone. people wonder later, and they're nobody's it's around to late. find out anything. Yeah, that's really neat that she did that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it written down somewhere? Yeah, yeah. I have it in. A, it's a little uh, notebook, uh, a binder with all the interviews in it. They're all fascinating to read. Oh, great! <laughs> all right. Um, so I don't know if anyone has any final says or. I'm good. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Hillbilly Justice on the School Bus podcast. Tune in next time to find out about our Hillbilly Summer Sausage. Until then, dream big and have fun. Mm -hmm.